So putting all of this information together, here on the left we have people who got pneumonia in this study, and on the right people who had dysphagia. So where is it, where's the overlap? Among those who had pneumonia, so the small yellow group on the right, uh, on the left, many, many of them had dysphagia. So you see the overlap consumes most of the yellow ball. Most of the, that's where the 81% are. But among those with dysphagia, only few develop pneumonia. Dysphagia alone was not enough to cause pneumonia. So what does that tell us? Maybe that managing dysphagia alone may not significantly improve pneumonia risk. It's an intriguing question and something that really made all of us think, what are we doing? We, if we think fixing dysphagia is going to fix the problem and eliminate the, you know, the risk of these horrible adverse outcomes, this study sure did not confirm this. So this was a very interesting time uh, in our field. Something that we've all learned now, and now what have I learned? This is part of this. Uh, and need to acknowledge is that people with dysphagia do not always get pneumonia. In the Langmore study that we just looked at, the incidence of pneumonia was 22%. Years later, in a much larger study of 515 patients with chronic dysphagia due to Parkinson's disease, dementia, or both, only 11% developed pneumonia. And these were people who were largely dependent for feeding and, and two-thirds of whom were chronic aspirators regardless of dietary modifications and people who did not use feeding tubes. They declined the use of feeding tubes. 11% incidence is much, much smaller than we all thought. We all thought it was a big thing, and 11% is a, a much smaller number than we expected. So this, all of these things have really taught us to think very differently about dysphagia alone uh, as, the, as the cardinal risk factor to manage and helped us to learn to broaden our um, view of risk factor management. And so she took a drink of water, she swallowed, and a couple seconds later, it shot out like a geyser out of her mouth. And she did that a second time. And so now we're starting to worry about dehydration. We're not sure what is going on what we could do immediately to get her hydration and to stop this. So I had overheard a gastroenterologist, literally in a van going to the airport, say that the lower esophageal sphincter opens during exhalation when we're swallowing. And I did not know that, but I've had a long-standing interest in breathing and swallowing. And I remembered that. It struck with me. So... I thought perhaps I could keep the lower sphincter open longer. Sometimes with liquids, they'll just drain or pour through the esophagus. You don't always have a peristaltic contraction. Uh, like with sequential drinking with liquids, the esophagus will relax and let the liquids flow through. So my thought was, how can I keep the lower esophageal sphincter open longer? And I decided that if I took her up to a higher lung volume and asked her to exhale slowly, we would have more air to exhale and more time for exhalation associated with the swallow. And that in turn would keep the lower sphincter open longer. So I told her to put the liquid in her mouth and to hold it, take a big breath in through her nose, swallow, and then exhale slowly. And she did that and it didn't come back up. And I couldn't believe it. And she did it again and it didn't come back up. And none of us could believe it. And if you work in a busy clinic, you know what happens next. I said, well, the time's up. I have to go on to the next patient. That's not really a therapy. I just made that up. So come back next week and we'll work on it. So Surprisingly, she did come back the next week, and what she said to me was, I don't need therapy. I have to do that. Now, McCullough et al. in 2004 also sounded in on this report that thickened liquid use has become one of the most common recommendations made by clinicians, and they reasoned that this method is easy to implement, and that's why the usage is so very common.
Suzanne Evans Morris posted in, uh, in 2009 on one of the dysphagia listservs um, a post that was significant to me, and I actually saved it for many years and um, wanted to tie it in here because I find her work to be produced in a very wise manner. So she says, to me, this statement, that is, that implementation of thick liquids is easy, reflects the very foundation of the problems we encounter with dehydration, appetite suppression, etc. We have chosen thickeners primarily because we believe they are easy to implement. However, as we implement, often without thinking and individualizing a program, and then we fail to follow up or even discuss the implications with care providers and family members. When dehydration or nutritional problems ensue, we often fail to perceive that this is related to our decision to use thickeners. If we consider and build time into our schedules for the types of follow-up needed, the solution of thickening liquids is not easy to implement. She goes on to say, another statement that is highly reflective of our current dilemma with the thickeners is that it's a belief. There is a well-accepted belief among clinicians that many of these patients will demonstrate a reduced aspiration risk or aspiration pneumonia risk if provided with liquids of increased viscosity. And the use of thickened liquids is based on that belief. Now I call it the myth of thickened liquids. So what I want you to keep in mind or take from this slide is the word compliance because we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about the difference between compliance and adherence, which is very important when we're trying to encourage our patients to follow um, safe recommendations for management of their dysphagia. It takes a paradigm shift and a change in our thinking. So um, keep that in mind as we continue through the next couple hours. We know that feeding tubes um, bear with it many um, negative sequela. It's been well demonstrated in the dementia population that tube feedings don't prevent aspiration. In many cases, they can contribute to aspiration it does not help in terms of improving their nutrition or help these individuals live longer, among many things. And not only in the Alzheimer's population, the dementia population, but I think we all see the problems associated with feeding tubes in our patients when they bounce back to the hospitals. There often are problems with the tubes being becoming blocked, um, they disintegrate, patients develop problems around the skin, accompanying pain, other issues, they may be pulled out or they may become dislodged, resulting in the need for multiple readmissions to manage these complications related to the feeding tube. So again, just as we recommend feeding tubes, we need to think about the um, negative sequela or the risk associated with a feeding tube placement depending on the patients that we're working with. So thinking about where the tracheostomy tube cuff is placed in the airway, let's think a bit more about what did we learn about tracheostomy tube cuffs. Well, cuff inflation will not prevent aspiration, especially aspiration of foods and liquids, large amounts. Inflated tracheostomy cuffs were designed to maintain the volume settings of ventilated patients and decrease the risk of aspiration of secretions in sedated individuals in particular. And this was uh, most notably with patients who had endotracheal tubes. Cuffs were never designed to prevent aspiration of food and liquids in alert individuals. If we think of that group of patients who we, we talked about a few slides ago, uh, alert individuals who were leaving, leading extended lives on ventilators and wanted to talk and to eat, the medical practice began to be, let's inflate the cuff and that would stop the 
food and liquid from getting into their lungs. But think about that anatomy. If food and liquid is on top of the cuff, it's already been aspirated. It's already in the patient's airway, and it will make its way around the sides of that cuff and further into the airway. We know from some of the literature that you will find in your references that individuals can be successfully ventilated with deflated tracheostomy tube cuffs. You can provide that ventilation, especially these alert individuals that we're talking about. Augusta Alba and John Bach in one of your uh, referenced articles talked about this many years ago. And their initial studies were with neuromuscular populations of individuals, but we've shown that for other patient populations, we can also successfully ventilate them with deflated tracheostomy tube cuffs. We have recently completed a similar study with vibration at the different rates in patients with dysphagia. Here there were 13 patients. Four of them had dysphagia after treatment for head and neck cancer, and nine of them had dysphagia after a stroke. These patients were given the rates, and 30 hertz produced no change. 70 hertz, again, produced a significant increase in swallowing. This incurred in all but one of the patients. 110 hertz also increased the rate of swallowing significantly. The other two did not significantly increase the rate of swallowing in the patients. So this suggests that 70 and 110 might be the optimal frequencies to stimulate over the larynx with a vibrator to activate swallowing in patients with dysphagia. We used guided imagery and some mindfulness techniques to really help her address some of that anxiety and that worry and to help her have a go-to strategy when she really felt that she needed support. The guided in imagery was very helpful and we would incorporate that in our dysphagia treatment sessions. But the mindfulness techniques actually she utilized um, spontaneously at home and during her day. One of the things that was really helpful was a mindfulness app that, that we actually loaded onto her, onto her cell phone. And so this app was um, programmed that every two hours she would actually have a Tibetan bell that would go off. And that would just essentially remind her to stop and take a breath and be aware of how she felt, to look at and to just tune in. I would say in my practice, um, really what I have found makes the most impact on dining and intake and functioning of in people in long-term care is lighting and contrast. There are very specific guidelines for lighting in um, care communities. I don't think that people realize how much additional light that older adults need. A healthy 60-year-old only receives about a third of the retinal luminance of a 20-year-old. So again, I said, you know, developing signs is an art. Getting the lighting right is an art too. And insufficient lighting makes it hard to see conversation partners. Um, it impacts whether a person can understand gestures and facial expressions um, or even speech if they rely on watching the speaker's mouth. Um, and so lighting should be assessed in the actual environment in which the activity takes place. Um, when I do a lighting assessment, I take light levels in the dining room at every single table. Because what I find is not only do care communities not have adequate light levels, we know that the light varies. You want a general ambient lighting of at least 50 foot candles in a dining room. Um, and so what I find is I might have a table where it's 20 and another table where it's 13 and another table where it's 45. If you're interested in changing the lighting in your care community to help improve intake, a good resource is the ECAT, the Environment and Communication Assessment Toolkit. I also really like Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's um, Lighting Research Center. They have great free resources online.